welcome back to Strange Mind 6. I'm your host, Ruby, and today we're going to be getting back into The Octonumi by Trevor Allen Forrest. But before we begin, please hit that like button and hit that subscribe button if you haven't subscribed yet. It would mean a lot to me. But without further ado, my dear friends, we're going to be getting into the Octonumi. So, grab a snack, grab a drink, or sit back, relax, and let's get to it. So let me get this straight. Reunited with their parents, siblings, and loved ones, the Cove is a picture postcard image of a perfect family day at the beach. Picnics underway, ice cream being handed out to studious sandcastle builders, paddling, surf splashing, and running brightly striped deck chairs. Rolled up trousers, hitched skirts, feet bare. How they were at the beach remained a mystery, considering there were no onward insomnates. The fact that this day was happening, being enough for even the most inquisitive, well, nearly. They have been here the whole time, Edgar finishes, addressing Margarine as she signals the ice cream cart. What can I tell you, Edgar? She replies, smiling at the trio of teddies operating the mechanized contraption that approaches her, ducking under the brightly colored parasol. She says, Give me the works. As the teddies spring into action, the elaborate dispenser chugs into life and begins the exaggerated performance of serving up an ice cream cone. And, he continues, watching as Marjorie accepts the outrageous concoction, am I to believe that we, you, haven't been able to locate them in all this time. Look, Edgar, Marjorie responds, digging her bare feet into the sand next to her hastily discarded boots, aware that everyone here was utterly inappropriately dressed for the beach. But for some reason she had yet to establish their abilities were blocked and no one had thought to bring an actual change of clothes we all have lots of questions but can we just for the moment be grateful that we have them back what's more she adds negotiating the mountain concoction we have word on our people. You know where they are? At the moment, we know they are safe and unharmed. Do you not think... He chides, turning away an offered ice cream, that perhaps Father Cadison butts in, glaring at him over her sister's head just for once. Can you live in the moment? Neither of us has unlimited time anymore. And we have Abigail back. I beg you, for her, please. But I... Edgar looks down at the little girl at his side. Yes, yes, of course. I... I'm sorry. Yes. Reaching for her hand, he requests three ice creams from the teddies, 
trolley, and either side of the small brunette, they head off to the rock pools. For someone who hasn't seen his daughter for so long, Trad says, joining his mother and Reg on an outcrop of rocks, watching them go, he doesn't seem that happy. Vibo, uh oh, Vivi mutters as her triple decker ice cream and wafer from the princess collection sparklings sprinkles drapery bits and all tumbles from her spot on trad's shoulder into the hood of his jacket we all deal with shock differently trad marjorie replies quickly looking away so as to not alert Trad to Phoebe's panic. And what about Nate and the others? Reg asks, struggling to keep a straight face as Phoebe bails the rapidly melting ice cream from Trad's top. Relax, Reg. Marjorie smiles. We have our people in safe zones. Nate cannot get to them, she pauses. Unfortunately, nor can we at the moment. However, our teams are exploring every possible lead on Nate, and as soon as we have the location on him, we will be able to retrieve our ops. She smiles. So, if there is anything, anything at all, you will know, she sighs, and as a precaution, an extra layer has been created. So, for now, at least this whole area is safe. Linking her arms in his, she continues, we can at least have a few hours to celebrate. It won't last long, but it will give us some time, and if I am not mistaken, you two have a title to defend. And in the blue corner, next chapter. The recycling rally held in Doris's little insomid once a year as part of the overall festivities, as usual, brought droves of festival goers from the Tarelian celebrations to watch the action. The seating packed so capac the seating packed to capacity, people hanging off scaffolding, standing on railings, jostling in the stalls for the best view crowds of family and friends negotiating their way to their seat as the popcorn sellers laden with their trays of goodies pick their way through the cheering crowd mumbles now free of his welding gear mumbles unhappily about his sculptures having to make way for the yearly event, sighing heavily, leaning against the cars forming the archway as more beings stream in, suddenly aware that someone is praising his now exiled to the outer yard sculptures he brightens up and shuffles in the direction of the praise. Addressing the darkness, the compere brings the carnival atmosphere of the arena to a hush. In the blue corner, he repeats, the reigning champion. A single spotlight floods the far side of the amphitheater. A hooded figure steps into the light. A roar goes up 
from the crowd. And in the red corner, he bellows, his voice booming above the roar. Also the reigning champion and joint title holder, back as challenger again. Another roar goes up from the crowd. Another spot floods the opposite corner. Another robed figure, his hood up, steps into the light. And so, the announcer calls. And so, he repeats, pausing until the cheering has quieted. And so I give you last year's winner, Tradian Everwick Thivamus. Throwing off his hood, Trad raises both arms, hands clenched to the noise, nodding and turns to applause. Turns to the applause, all eyes falling on Vibi as she sounds the foghorn she holds above her head. And his rival, the announcer continues, and also last year's winner, Regis Sedwint Eniaxus. As Reg repeats his brother's moves, the crowd, V, to themselves heard, Reg, 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 melding with, Tread, tread, tread. And the foghorn blasting out echoes around the auditorium. Removing their robes, both boys flex their arms, crick their necks, stretch their legs, shake their hands, and reach for their controllers. The crowd now hushed, almost silent, but for the sound of anticipation. Now then, lads, the announcer's lowered voice resonates through the quiet. As the boys approach each other, a glass ball perched on an extended mechanized arm swivels down between them and is suddenly illuminated from within. The compare, now visible, virtually fills the small sphere his wild hair, facial and otherwise, covers his entire face, bar of bulbous, a bulbous nose, dark circular glasses and flattened top hat, long spindly arms supporting large white gloved hands, compete for space while holding an equally large microphone. You know the rules, he continues holding a mic to where one would assume his mouth is. Hands on only, no magic, he smiles, holding the mic out to the crowd who in the blackness chant back. It's not magic! It's not magic! Yes, yes, he laughs, holding up his hand. You know what I'm saying, so boys, he gestures to the crowd to be quiet, thumping the side of the sphere. The top half flips up to reveal that the entire thing was clearly magnified as the tiniest hairiest being steps onto the edge addressing the boys now then it was a tie last year so this year it's a fight to the end you both know the rules he calls out to the crowd who greet this with jeering i want a clean game he shouts over the noise the judge's decision is final 
he booms, signaling up to the heights. Three spots pierce the dark, swinging around the crowd finally, settling on the bewitchers, who with a large cat at their side sit in thrones of recycled rubbish. Francine smiles politely, offering a slight inkling of her head, while her sisters leap to their feet, Elonabeth screaming, Come on, Reg! And Satrice, Try to win! Try to win! Francine's eyes roll to the sky as the lights flick away from them. Okay. The announcer quips, No favoritism there, then. So, he returns to the boys, I want you to shake hands, go back to your corners, and on my signal, come out fighting. The dome of the orb flicks shut and swoops up. The boys shake hands and return to their corners. The spots are joined by several others, light lighting the central arena. The crowd is silent. Ding ding! Fight! By the way, Doris, now full size, shouts as she nudges Veith. This is for you. She drops a small, colorful silver charm in her hand, immediately sparkling the interest of VB. As the boys circle each other in the arena, he made it for you last year. That's what he was coming to see me about. Vithjin studies the miniature carousel horse, pushing Vibi's head out of the way as she tries to do the same. He made it in my insomid, Doris continues. You know, she indicates Vith's brain with the mind thing. She states, You know, with my intimate being off grid. Veith nods. A cheer goes up. Phoebe tears herself away from the shiny charm to cheer Trad as he faces the crowd and pumps the air. Yeah, well, anyway, Dora shrugs, still following the battle below. It's for you. That's why he comes to see me, for you. And she hesitates. He, um, he lost it, Doris mutters, glancing sidelong at Veith. And I, I, uh, I found it, so. She pauses, following the fight a little too intently. So that's why he's been coming to see me for you and she adds gesturing the fight the kick-ass bot I built for him Veith raises her eyebrows glancing at the foot-high robot currently smashing into Trad's robotic efforts sending it skidding across the arena yes Doris smiles and pumps her arm. You built? You... Wreath hesitates, glancing down at Reg's machine. Well, half built. Doris cuts in, looking sideways at Wreath. Well, helped a lot with... Alright, a bit. But I made great tea. She sighs. He likes his tea. Feith hugs her and kisses the top of her head. Pushing her away, Doris struggles to get free. Hey, okay, for goodness sake, she moans, grinning. The swoosh of a firework and following bursts of falling light above them distracts the crowd followed by another, creating a ripple of confusion. The fireworks aren't due until the end. No good trying to put me off. 
Trad. Rez shouts, I'm winning, Mr. Regis, sir. Me? It's, it's not me. His words are drowned out by thousands of tiny fireworks exploding in the sky. Excited screams flow around the arena in the auditorium as it's filled with showering specks of color, light cascading down. Mr. Regis only mumbles from his vantage point of the swinging bird cage, sees the source of a white beam that saps down from the black night above them as Mr. Regis. One by one, each of the children are engulfed in shafts of brilliant white light. What the? Reg exclaims. Pemity! Trad mutters. Dropping the controllers, he bolts towards her, striding over the seat, pushing their occupants aside. He sees her. She's standing. He climbs some more. Pemity tries to move, but is stopped by an invisible force surrounding her. She shouts, but knows she cannot be heard. The fireworks send the crowd into appreciative clapping. With everyone standing now, he's lost sight of Hamity. Then she's there, right there, her hands pressed flat on some sort of barrier. Glancing around, Trad sees the other children all trapped in a visible cylindrical fields of light. She's banging now, her little fists making no sound, and they slam against the force, keeping her there. Trad reaches her, feeling his way around the circular field. VB scales its sides, discovering its endless height. Pemity opening her mouth to say something. Pemity looks up, then back at Trad. She screams silently, hands pressed to the barrier. The light intensifies, and then it's gone. She's gone. All of the children are gone. The fireworks, the last of them, crackle and fade to be replaced by sobbing, being poured into the arena, demanding an explanation, margarine swamped by the surge is scooped up, is scooped up by mumbles and deposited on the announcer's orb from where she tries to calm the hysteria, collapsing into Pamity's seat. Trad buries his head into his hands, trying to block out the noise, trying to lock onto her. He can hear Veith. There's nothing, she says, somewhere in his head, not on any of them. Reaching his brother, Reg places a hand on his hunched shoulders sharing a despairing glance with Phoebe as she swoops down and hugs Trad's neck, a glint, a glint of something. Stooping to get a closer look, Reg reaches between the planks, his hand jarring on its heel. If he could just... Grasping the slim silver pen between his two stretched fingers, Reg maneuvers it up through the narrow gap, a fountain pen with a message engraved on the side. He turns it to the light to make out the words, glancing down at Trad. Reg silently covers the pen with his hand, looking around at the mayhem below, and discreetly places it in his pocket. The words engraved on its shiny surfaces running through his mind to Snookums. I cannot believe that he has the children now. 
It must have been Nate, right? Well, my dear friends, that's the end of those two chapters. I do hope that you enjoyed them. And the next video will be the last chapter of the Octonumi. So, I want to thank you for spending time with me and for listening to the story. And with that, my dear friends, this is Ruby signing off. <laughs>